finding your dharma or your soul's purpose, realizing your calling, usually, most of the time, comes from a place of being brokenhearted, Mm -hmm. right? Or in a place of the hardest suffering for some reason. So we get into that vulnerable place and then we start peeling that onion, I like to say, or or seeing things more clearly um, from that place. So that's one of the characteristics of Dharma that that many times we seek our calling from a place of misery or heart, being heartbroken. Mm. So chaos and calm go together. Welcome to Warriors at Work. This is Jeannie Coomber, your guide and host. Warriors at Work is a place where everyone in the workplace can come together, gain insight, encouragement, tell stories, connect, and share wisdom. We are a place of like-minded people at different stages of life, all coming together with a shared interest of enlightening and inspiring one another. If you're interested in going from the predictable to the potent, and you want to find your warrior magic, step into the journey with us. Welcome to Warriors at Work. Hi, everybody. It's Jeannie Coomber. Thanks so much for joining me here at the Warriors at Work podcast. So today's conversation is about discovering your dharma. I believe that the world is in a great state of pause and awareness. Many of us are asking the big questions. Is this really what life is about? What else is here? And it's from this place that I reached out to my dear friend and colleague, Liza Bertini, for her perspective. As a yoga teacher, a coach, a speaker, and the dean of the Kripalu School of Yoga, Liza is often in the center of journeys. In this conversation, Liza shares her perspective on what it means to find your dharma or your true calling and guides us on a fascinating path of self-discovery to the center of who we are in the world. This is a timely and beautiful conversation for those of you who are sitting in the chair at a crossroad and are seeking clarity as you explore the possibilities all around you. Thank you for being here. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Warriors at Work podcast. So today's conversation is an extension of some things that I've been in conversation around all month uh, around leading and living all from the heart and with the heart and really doing the inside work to help us have a greater awareness and experience on the outside. And what I've been noticing in talking with colleagues and clients is I feel like the world is in a great state of pause. It's like we we got our vision corrected and you've been handed a pair of glasses or contact lenses and you're seeing things for the first time that have been there all along, but you have so much more clarity and focus and it's surfacing bigger questions around is this my life? Are these the choices that I've made? What here could be shifted? Or where do I need to have more clarity and more focus? So enter this conversation around what's called the Dharma discovery. And you may have heard the word Dharma in the beginning of a yoga class. It often will set the intention and create perspective around what is it you're here for? What would you like to do be or embody when you're on your mat. And my guest here this morning, my dear friend and colleague, Liza Bertini, who has deep, deep knowledge around this conversation around Dharma. She is filled with perspective and experience and expertise around yoga, meditation, mindfulness, and teaches a class at Kripalu around the Dharma discovery. So she is going to unpack this for us today and leave us with some powerful things that we can do right away in our life to step more towards our life purpose, our life path, which is often how Dharma is described. So Liza, thank you so much for being in this conversation with me today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to 
to talk about this because it's a passion of mine. So here is where I would love to start. When you think about the world we are in right now, personally and professionally, what do you see? A lot. <laughs> I, see, I see and I feel that there's this collective um, on a, a large scale and also an individual scale, um, a yearning for like meaning and purpose mm. and um, understanding about our place within the world and how we can contribute in a bigger way. You know, whether uh, whether that's through social social justice or activism or just doing good in the world, like doing something that's meaningful and purposeful. So that is Dharma, really, that journey of figuring that out for ourselves. And I think we see that collectively in the world and also mm. on an individual level with people I've talked to um, and, and our, you know, how we fit into all of that. So you obviously have had years of experience in yoga and meditation, but you're also a very well-experienced business professional. You've been in HR, you've been in corporate America, and you've figured out a way to marry the two ideas. Why did this subject of exploring your Dharma and creating a course called the Dharma Discovery, why was that important to you? Because it was my journey. So... I worked in HR uh, for years. I got my master's in in that. Um, really enjoyed what I was doing. I was good at what I did, and I enjoyed what I was doing. However, I felt that there was something missing. You know, I went to work every day. I did my best, um, but I and I and I saw that there was good in what I was doing, but there wasn't a connection with the heart, my heart. Mm. Um, and then I had a broken engagement. And, you know, one of the things, one of the characteristics of Dharma is that um, calling follows chaos. So when you... Wait, wait. calling follows chaos. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Say more about that. Or we could say chaos and calling go together. That's awesome. Right. So so, um, finding your Dharma or your soul's purpose, realizing your calling usually most of the time comes from a place of being brokenhearted, Mm -hmm. right. Or in a place of the heart is suffering for some reason. So we get into that vulnerable place and then we start peeling that onion. I like to say, or, or seeing things more clearly um, from that place. So that's one of the characteristics of Dharma that, that many times we seek our calling from a place of misery or heart being heartbroken. Mm. So chaos and calm go together. And um, that's where I was. I had all these plans for myself. And a few months before my wedding was scheduled, um, the relationship ended. Mm. And I then moved into this practice of yoga. I started this teacher training. And um, I realized through the, the study that yoga, one of my teachers said, um, that yoga really is the full participation of life to be fully engaged in life. And I realized I was standing on the sidelines. That's what I was doing. I was just living, you know, in this autopilot, um, way. And then when I started really diving into this concept of, you know, what's my truth? Who am I? What am I here to do? How can I be more engaged? How can I live fully and get off the sidelines? That's when my that's when my real path started. Mm. So I think I'm so passionate about it because I worked in HR. I was a career coach as well. Like I was, I liked helping people figure out um, their career and what to do. And then when I started this own journey of mine, I realized, yeah, it's about your career, but it's much bigger because not everyone's dharma is their career. We can talk more about that as well. Um, But so, yeah, that's why I'm so passionate about it because I've been on the journey myself. So, yeah, I want to go back to the career part in in just a minute. Uh, Mm -hmm. But first, let's let's zoom out for a second. So talk to us about what the Dharma Discovery experience is like at Kripalu. Like, who's the typical profile of people that come to this? 
Yeah. So I taught this program in multi-day program, um, a long weekend, Friday to Sunday, pretty much. And for several years, and it is a place where people come who are, they're all seeking clarity Mm. in some way. You know, they, many people will think that it's about their career. You know, what, what should I do next? What's the next step? And then they realize, many people realize during the program that what they were seeking might not have had anything to do with the career. Um, I had one woman tell me at the end of the program that she realized she really has to focus on her marriage, that she was neglecting her relationship with her partner. And that's what came out of the the self-study she did in the program. It wasn't about the career. Um, so everybody who comes in the room, I think is seeking some clarity. Um, and what I think people find is it's, it's a time to, to step into self-discovery and, you know, like yoga is for me, it's like time to come home to oneself, you know, to learn or remember the parts of ourselves that we've forgotten. Mm. So, yeah. So, um, and it's not always easy it, that that process of getting to know ourselves in ways that we may not have wanted to, you know, things we don't want to look at, things we've swept under the rug or stuffed down, the emotional parts that we uh, just, you know, numb ourselves to. That comes up in this process of self discovery. So, can you talk a little bit about? Take us through like what what would the beginnings of this look like? So you have I'm, I'm having this vision of a bunch of people in a room. They're all in different phases of life. Some are there for more of the tactical transactional things, like you're mm-hmm. saying. Others are like, something isn't right. Something has surfaced for me that I need to look at. Tell us how you begin this journey with someone. Because the other thing that I'm thinking about, which I'd love to talk about next, is more around. Anybody that's listening or watching this that has some resistance to this, that may be very, re, very focused on the things that they have to produce or support in some way. And this feels more like a, I don't know, something that isn't available to them and may feel like an indulgence rather than something that's very much in their life path. So just talk just more about the the workshop experience first, and then I'd love to talk about that second part. Yeah. So a lot of the workshop is, um, I'd like to say, you know, self-discovery work or self-assessment work is what we call it in, in career coaching. It's really looking at our values, our, you know, core desired feelings, which you and I, we've talked about that, you know, how do you want to feel in your life? Mm. Um, it's about looking at your motivated skills, these things that we are good at and we're proud of and we like to do not necessarily experts at it but things that we do enjoy doing um those those never change those are from when you're little and you're doing these you know you're playing and doing these things in your in in your life and those skills actually those motivated skills are with you your whole life in Mm -hmm. different ways so um looking at those looking at interests Right. We do one exercise that I love. I call it um, speed dating. And we write down 25 things that we love. And then you pick uh, two things. And it could be anything. It could be playing with my dog. Right. Or, you know, taking care of dogs or whatever. It could be, um, you know, it could be knitting. It could be anything. And or it could be work related. It could just be anything. And they put it on the list and they pick out of the 25. They pick two things. And then they go around the room, we do the speed dating thing, and they ask each person, okay, I love playing with my dog. How can I do this as a living? Like, what? how can I bring this into like some sort of career? Um, and people give them ideas. And if the person gives it, like they need to give them like two ideas. And if they give them the same idea as somebody else, the somebody who are, somebody else gave them, they then have to say, I already have that idea. Give me another idea. So when they, and then they only have like two minutes with each person. So we go around the room and then at the end, they have a whole list of ideas and people are in like just shock about how many great ideas people have for them. So 
Um, so we do stuff like that, like fun things too, to get mm. people uh, in this creative space of thinking outside the box, right? It's like, can you think outside the box and use the wisdom of the other people in the room to help us? To, like, can we all help each other on this journey? Um, the one thing about it is, you know, you talk about resistance and in yoga, we talk about the, our edge. Have you ever heard that? Um, like in the poses in, uh, on your mat in, yes. asanas, when we talk about like move to your edge, but you know, meaning like go to the edge of the pose, don't hurt yourself, right? Don't mm-hmm. push yourself too far, but can you go up to that edge and, and meet that resistance and, you know, that's scary. It's always scary to meet your edge, whether it's on the yoga mat or anywhere else. And the thing about our edge, and one of my other yoga teachers in my journey said this about our edge, our edge is constantly changing, right? So when, so you, meet true. That edge, when you meet that edge, right? And then you realize, ah, it's not that bad, right? The edge actually moves out a little bit more, right? It's always expanding. So if you don't meet that edge, if you don't keep going up and meeting that edge, we'll never live to our full potential. You just described 2020. I think anybody that's listening or watching this is like, I I don't even think we realized what we were capable of. And what we're still capable of is like that, that edge keeps showing itself every day. Like, well, you went here, you know, especially... And I know you do the same thing in in a lot of client conversations. It's really important to measure your progress, especially if you're getting stuck with where you currently are. Like, how did you get here? What were some of the other things that you navigated that led to this moment? You didn't just arrive here. We went through a process. I love that. How do you meet your edge? You reminded me of uh, Kundalini. Kundalini very much represents that is how do you find your edge and, and not be reckless, but just meet it and embrace mm-hmm. it and notice right. what happens when you meet your edge. I've, mm-hmm. I use a lot of times the expression of how do you play with the edges or right. color outside the lines? Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, that's really cool. So I think a lot of people meet their edge in this process of discovering their dharma. You know, they're, it, it's a process of of stumbling and trying new things and failing, you know, Mm. like to figure out, is this the right, does it, how does this feel for me? You know, does this, does this make my heart sing this, this work, this, this project? And that's the only way we can really figure out our Dharma Dharma is to try things, see how they try them on, see how it feels. Um, So it's a, it's a process and people get stuck there's a few things, there's a few big things that I've seen. And one is people want to make the perfect choice, the perfect step. The next <laughs> I knew, step I knew perfectionism. That. I knew perfectionism was gonna show up here. It's like if you're yeah. listening to this and you want an A, that's not what right. this is about. Yep. Right. Yep. So many people feel like the next step has to be the perfect one. And then they just never make it because they're, mm. oh, I don't know if it's gonna be the perfect step. So they just never do it. Um, another one is people choose being unhappy over un- uncertainty. So they'd rather be unhappy than be uncertain about something. Um, and I love this quote by Anthony Hopkins, actually. Uh, you know, just thinking about that, like every, every day is really unknown, right? So w- we're so afraid of the unknown, but like every day is unknown. And Anthony Hopkins said this quote, today is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday. Today is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday. I love that. You know, so every day is unknown. So if we, we just, we have to think about that. Like every step, everything we do is unknown. You know, Mm. the next 10 minutes of my life is unknown. Um, So getting stuck in the idea of being like comfortable um, because I don't want to be in the unknown. It's like, it, it's all unknown. Look at 2020. There's yeah. like whoever thought, you know? So um, we have to get out of that just idea of like staying unhappy because we don't want to be in that uncertainty. You know, it's like, 
I think about the trapeze, like holding one bar and then reaching for the other bar. But there's that moment that you're in between mm-hmm. and it's, so mm. scary, you know, but we have to get past that. We have to like have faith that the other bar is there, you know. Um, if if you choose to go down this path, and I think that's the other thing is like all of this work is choice. Oh yeah, well, it's it mm-hmm. and it isn't easy, and it does require time. It does require unpacking of some uncomfortable things, and looking at yourself, and maybe facing some things that you didn't like or didn't, uh, mm-hmm. or you have some judgment around, but. It's such a freeing thing. I think the the vision of the trapeze is really palpable because once you've let go of that other bar, now you're on the new bar. You just look at that. Well, you got me here. Thank you for that. You can almost get to a place where you bless whatever the discomfort, whatever the pain is that has been surfaced. But I think, again, anybody listening or watching, this is not like this is not just an easy transaction. It's it's for those that are sitting with those questions and saying, wait a second, what is this here? But you always have free choice. You don't have to do any of it. But if you choose, here are some things that could surface from this that are quite beautiful, quite freeing, and very inspirational. That's how I'm translating everything that you're saying. Yeah, that's, and you know, one of the things on my list of, um, why people get stuck is choice because mm. there's two co- two sides of the coin. One is too many choices. There's too many things to do. I don't know which one to pick. So I'm just gonna, not going to do any of them. Mm. Um, and then the other one is that we just forget we have a choice, mm. you know, um, in this book. And I, I mentioned this book to you before. Um, oh, my camera, the great work of your life by um, Stephen Cope. He's a Kapala teacher. It's an amazing book. He talks about how many people in, in life, they come to a crossroads, they open up their folding chair and sit down or their lounge chair, or whatever. And um, they sit and they procrastinate. And they're like, well, I could do that. Or I could stay on this path. Or I could make this turn and go down this path. But I'm just going to wait. It, you know, I'll figure it out one day. I'll just wait. And they sit there. And then they forget that they have a choice and they don't ever move. So I think, you know, we have to remember we have a choice. Every day we wake up, we have a choice of what we're going to do with our time. And sometimes we get stuck in the, I have too many responsibilities, Mm. I don't have time, you know, all these excuses, um, which are really the resistance that's coming up. I love this um, one one little quote uh, phrase called um, your gnawing is your knowing. Mm. So like that, you know, that uh, place of um, restlessness, there's, you know, when you're feeling like there's something else, like, what is it? I, I need to figure out what's that restlessness. That gnawing is your knowing, right? Your knowing of that, you need to move. You need to make a choice. You need to do this work. So. That's what I'm noticing is a very common theme. I mean, just since the be- the year began, I've had over a dozen different people come to me and ask some questions, whether it, should I be doing more of the personal branding work? Should I be doing more strategy? That's usually how it's characterized. Or it's like, I'm not happy with where I am. So they're having this knowing. There is this stirring that's going on. Um, Am I in the right marriage? Am I making the right choices for my family? Should I move? Uh, You know, is this the environment in which I I feel I'm going to be successful? Will I be able to influence some of these things? Uh, It's really extraordinary. So I love that expression. Knowing is knowing is your knowing. Um, It's it's not about. It's, it's also like to think about all those things you just mentioned, when you have that um, restlessness, it doesn't always mean you have to make a change. Mm. You know, it doesn't, it, it means that you need to figure out if what you're doing is the right thing. You know, you might be questioning that for some reason. And maybe there are little changes you need to make. You don't have to like completely just like say, oh, 
I'm restless in my marriage. I need to just leave and done. You know, it's like, okay, there's something there that doesn't align with me, with my heart, with my inner knowing. So what are the changes I need to make? What do, what do I need to investigate or step into the inquiry of this topic? Like, what do I need to know? Mm. So I can, so I can figure out what this restlessness is. You know, that you just you just took the words right out of my brain because that it's what it's a practice that I will often have if I feel unsettled about something. Maybe it's a decision or I'm trying to help a company or a client with something and I'm struggling with a path forward. I I have this process that I do at night. And a colleague suggested it to me, and it's so, so important, and it really is helpful. So I will say out loud, help me. And then, you know, I talk to guides, angels. Sometimes I talk to my parents. Uh, Before I go to bed, I will say out loud, I need help with X, Y, and Z. When I'm sleeping, help me to know what I need to know. Take it out of my brain, off of my shoulder so that I could rest and integrate it however you see fit. It is so helpful. Or if in the morning, you know, as you know, I'm a big journaler and I like to get my thoughts on paper, that might be the first question is what is it I need to know today? What is it you want me to investigate? And it will really surface a lot of wisdom. Again, free choice. You don't have to do anything with it. But Mm -hmm. I find that it's like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that was bothering me. Oh, I didn't know that might be something I should consider. Uh, Often other people will come into my mind, which then gives me an opportunity to reach out and have conversations like this around all of these things. But all of that goes right back to this Dharma discovery is investigating all parts of yourself. It's not necessarily a project plan or a strategy that you have to put into place over a certain period of time. It's like be in the investigation. That's how I'm translating everything that you're saying. Yeah, Yeah. it's life. This is life, you know, like it's the fully, it's like what I was saying about yoga, like fully engaging and participating in life. It's not walking away from it and, pretending it's not there because it's going to be there always unless we step into that inquiry, that investigation, that, you know, um, that place of, of awareness, you know, of mindfulness, of seeing um, Mm. what's true and real in the moment. Um, Yeah. I go ahead. I was just going to say the one other thing that I just wanted to, say sometimes gets in people's way and, and, um, you know, stops them from moving forward in this work is, uh, other people's expectations of them. So sometimes these are inherited beliefs or just things that we've heard our parents say like, Oh, you shouldn't be an actor. How are you going to make money doing that? Mm -hmm. Like you should just be a lawyer like your father. And people then decide, oh, well, maybe they're right. And, they, you know, um, so subtle messages that we've gotten along the way have really determined, many of us have determined our life's path based on these Mm. expectations or beliefs of other people. I call them inherited beliefs. And so I just want to say one great question to ask yourself when these things surface is who says? Like who says, you know, like when, um, one example is, um, a subtle message is, uh, isn't it a shame that Bill makes more money than his wife, you know, like just like somebody saying like your mother saying that to you or something is like uh, a mess. There's a message there. And if you just say, who says, who says that it's, it's a shame that he makes more money, you know, like, yes. or who says I should be a lawyer? Like who says you like, so really dig down. Like, is it me who believes this or is it my mother who believes this? Hmm. So just asking, who says, who says, um, but I think we do go down a road of it, like believing these inherited beliefs or following these beliefs. And then we get so far down the road of being the lawyer with the big house and the nice cars and the big responsibilities that we never think there's a way out. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, how can I turn around now? I've already done it. 
you know, but I say to people or, you know, like I think, of, I think of people in that position and I, I want to say to them, you are so successful doing this, this thing you don't even like doing. Think about how successful so true. You, and so how happy you would be if you were actually doing something that you loved. Oh my you goodness, Liza, that is successful. so true. That is you know? so true. That's where we, we rely and I'm speaking for myself because I've certainly been in situations like that. That's where we rely so heavily on our professional attributes. We know how to pr- be producers. We know how to be executors. We know how to project plan the hell out of anything. We can run yeah. circles around anybody for creativity and drive, drive, drive. I'm a workhorse. I could do the da 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 it's so true. And so often we, we've created these amazing architectures around something that is not aligned with our true purpose. And again, no judgment. It's just amazing what our capabilities are, which actually leads me to my next question. Cause you have this amazing expression, which ties directly to this, which is don't confuse excellence with purpose. So tell us what it means. And why do you think that idea prevents others from exploring their dharma. So that refers to, um, it's, it's not so much what you can do or what you're good at doing. It's what you love to do. When you think about dharma, you could be, let's just go back to the lawyer example, the best lawyer ever, you know, like just performs so well is so, you know, well-regarded in their field, uh, top of the ladder, right? But if you, like I just said, if you're not, if you don't love that, um, there's that, that misalignment to that soul's purpose. Um, you know, there's other things that are going to uh, manifest from that, right? And we can talk about that in a second. So to think about, it's about what you love to do. And if you're not the best at that, you know, but you love it and you want to do that and you know that that will bring so much meaning and purpose to your life, don't not do it because you don't think you're an expert at it, you know, Mm. it's it's, do it. The more you do it and the more you put your heart and soul into it, the better you're going to get at it anyway. You know, um, isn't there that book outlier you know, Mm -hmm. um, by Malcolm Gladwell about like, you're not an expert at something until you give it 10,000 hours anyway, you know, so So don't not do it. Don't not pursue that path because you think, oh, I could never be a, you know, look, look at you. Like, Mm -hmm. did you ever think 10 years ago, you would be running a podcast and be doing all these things? Like, no, like 10 years ago, you probably be like, what? I, how could I ever do that? And now you're doing it and you're doing it so well because you're so passionate about it. So um, don't confuse excellence with purpose. Um, Your purpose is not the thing, possibly not the thing that you're excellent at. Mm. You know, it's the thing that makes your heart sing. It's the thing that you love to do. I want to support what you just said and, and elaborate a little bit about this whole warrior journey and, I've shared this in some circles, but I haven't fully shared the story. And I think that the real, the real takeaway is I've been a executive coach for I'm now on 16 years and around 14 years in, I was like, I felt somewhat complete. Like I had done all I was meant to do. I learned all I needed to learn and my life was meant for something bigger. And my life was meant to go from one to one, which I still do by the way, but not at the level that I was before, I was meant to do one to many. It was not a logical thought. It was not a logical decision because of course, financially and all the things that go with establishing a business that took me years to do and years to hone a craft. I felt this urge to make the shift and expand a footprint and to do more in this quote unquote media space and to do things like Facebook live and podcasts and doing them more and more. It was a totally illogical thing. And frankly, I sucked at it when I first started, but I knew I needed to lean in and learn more and more and more. And the more that I leaned into it, the more I started to learn about myself around, I do have a lot to offer here. 
I can talk about things in a different way. And I have a unique perspective given I was a leader in business. I now coached senior leaders in business for many years. I know what it's like to sit in a room with a leader that's making a difficult decision. I can help them manage through that. And there is tremendous wisdom about saying, we can talk about all of the things that impact that person in the workplace. It isn't just about how smart you are and how you're making smart leadership choices. It's all the things around it that contribute to your overall happiness and well-being. And that is really where this idea was born. I didn't call it my Dharma discovery then. I called it more. I had a divine download. I had like tons of messages and tons of signs that I was meant to do something on a bigger level. And it was terrifying as hell. And little did I know that the the pandemic would say, guess what you're doing it right now. You're you're about to you're about to pivot your whole world and get into service to the business community. And I almost wish we were having this conversation this time last year because you probably could have helped me navigate this a lot uh, less painfully than uh, how I navigated it. But I am so deeply grateful for being in this conversation with you, Liza. Uh, You surfaced so many amazing things here. I'd love to leave with one question for you, which is, when you look at Liza Bertini's dharma and the path that you're on, what could you leave with us that gives us a little bit of personal insight into you as somebody who is really living this and sharing this and coaching this in other people? So first of all, I just want to say, I love what you just shared. So the, it, you know, and even if we had the conversation a year ago, um, you know, yes, maybe it would have been a little less painful, but you still had to do all that work yourself, yeah. you know, and you did it. And, and this is where the the gift is, you know, the gift is now that you're actually in it and living it and enjoying it and learning from it and growing from it. So that's the, the seed was planted when you had that download and then you actually tended that seed, you know, that's our job um, in life is to, we each get in the yoga philosophy, there's this understanding that or belief that we're all given that seed, you know, that mm. unique calling, that gift is inside of us. And it's our job during our lifetime to uncover what that is and then tend to that seed. So that's that's what you're that's what you've done, which is awesome. Thank you um, for saying that. Yeah, yeah. And so I would say, I know one other thing, a lot one question that comes up a lot is can you only have one Dharma? You know, do you have several Dharmas during your life or is there one? And people might have different takes on that. I am, I believe that we have one, we have one overarching Dharma that is, I guess you could say, and I'll, I'm going to tell you what mine is. And I, and, and it's kind of like my mission, you know, I feel like it's my mission. It's my calling. And then Within that dharma, that could manifest or show itself in many different ways. Like you can do many different way, things to support your dharma, but really that dharma is one thing. And Simon Sinek talks about it as your why, right? Mm. And he also believes that you have one why and that why is the same why throughout your life. Um, so mine is, you know, and it's evolved over time. Like when I left my corporate job and opened my yoga studio, I thought that was my dharma. I'm like, that's my dharma is to run a yoga studio. It it wasn't to run the yoga studio. That was just one part of it showing itself. But really, it's about um, fostering community and offering experiences for people to to inspire others to live conscious, healthy, meaningful, and authentic lives. Mm. So that's really what. I feel like my mission is, is to um, build community, offer experiences to inspire other people to live in this way um, that's just more authentic and conscious and healthy and meaningful. And I do that by, you know, teaching. I do it by the work I do at Kripalu, where I'm working with other faculty so they can do it in the world. Um, 
I do it by uh, writing. I do it by parenting. I'm hoping I'm doing it with my two kids. <laughs> Um, I'm doing it through conversations like this with you. I do it through coaching. So there's all different ways, you know, running retreats. There's all different ways that I can bring that into the mm. world. Um, but I feel like all of it supports that ultimate Dharma. And, mm. I, and it's been, it's been in, you know, it took me a long time to really craft the words around it. But once I did, it's, it has not changed. You know, it feels, I love that. It feels so right. It fe- it really. I move from that place. Mm. Of how can I? Su- how can I keep supporting that? I can tell when you say conscious, healthy, and meaningful. Those you really embody those words, and it creates a different energy when you say it. So, what an amazing way to end this conversation! And I wish everyone that's listening, watching that a few things surface for you that you could step into and start to play with the edges and see what you'd like to shift, what you want more of in your life. And maybe it's more consciousness, maybe it's more health, maybe it's more meaning, but what a huge gift here, Liza. Thank you so much for being with me. I loved, loved being in this conversation with you. Me too. Thank you so much. I'm so happy we got to do this. Thanks everybody for listening to another episode of Warriors at Work and letting us be a part of your warrior journey. You can ask questions and make suggestions for future topics at jc at com. Connect with me personally on LinkedIn and Instagram and join us on the Warrior Conversations channel on YouTube and at the Warrior Magic Community page on Facebook. You can find links to all these places on my website, JeannieCoover.com. And most importantly, be sure to tell friends about us, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Spreaker, and Spotify. It helps others find the show and puts more Warrior Magic out into the world.